talk to you about income inequality. And the main thing that you need to know about income inequality is that it's getting worse in Canada. Uh, that it's getting worse in good times and in bad. And that's not always been the case in our history. Um, this is what happened to income inequality uh, in Canada since 1980. So I've just shared some Ontario data. This is, um, let's take a look at what happened to the richest 10, 20%, the middle 20%, and the bottom 20%. So you can see here um, that the richest 20% in Canada got pretty healthy income gains over this uh, period of time. Uh, the poorest 20% lost ground, lost 11% ground. And then here's the middle class. So essentially, let's zoom in here. When we talk about the shrinking middle class in Canada, this is the sort of thing that economists and statisticians are referring to. Um, so here's a detail for you. $40,000. That is the estimated amount of benefits that middle income Canadian households benefit from what our taxes pay in terms of public services. So, so if our taxes didn't buy these public services, that's the extra money you have to shell out of your own pocket to cover that. So public services are a great equalizer in society. So what can you do about income inequality? You can make sure that we have great public services. Here's another number, uh, $17 billion. Since uh, Ontario implemented uh, endless round of tax cuts since the mid-1990s. This is the cumulative annual amount of revenues lost now to tax cuts, to, to the tax cut agenda. Um, we could gain $3 billion alone just by reverting the corporate income tax in Ontario to the 2009 level. Um, and we'd still be a fairly low uh, corporate income tax jurisdiction. a little bit more about resiliency and a little less about environmental sustainability. I think they're both uh, things that really fit together, but I think resilience is the thing that uh, that brings sustainability into the into the realms of income inequality and democracy. So in transition, in the group that I work with, uh, resilience can take many different forms. One of those forms is a low carbon economy. So we're looking at uh, how can we use less fossil fuels. Another form is avoiding and adapting to climate change. Another way is uh, localizing wherever possible. Um, resilience in other works has the same definition but perhaps different applications. In, in government and policy it's about making our, or in my opinion, it's about making our economic and political systems more adaptive. So I see good governance as truly responding to the needs of the people not getting caught up in power trips, uh, being able to change and respond quickly to new situations. I see the fight for a stronger democracy um, and electoral reform as part of that, as getting to this point where we can uh, improve our national, provincial, and local government. But there are a lot of ways that uh, we can merge environmental goals and uh, social goals. One example would be, say, community gardens. So we know that um, fresh, local, organic, accessible food, those are all things that are really good for the environment. But also, people having access to that fresh, local, healthy food um, reduces their dependency on uh, grocery stores, um, like makes them more resilient to a rise in food prices, and they have better access. So I think that's what I would like to see us striving towards in all of our work, in environmental and social justice and democracy work, is. Uh, striving towards that goal of resilience. Thank you. The current system that we have, frequently uh, labeled first past the post, uh, also single member plurality, um, does have advantages. It has strengths. Uh, uh, it's a simple system to understand, it's easy to administer. Uh, perhaps most of all, the thing that uh, the editorial boards uh, in 2007 uh, and a lot of opponents of MMP focused on was that it promotes 
uh, territorial representation, this, uh, this sacrosanct link between the voter, uh, the representative, and the territory, the constituency. And uh, perhaps uh, one of the most cherished uh, values of the current electoral system is its promotion, allegedly again, of governmental stability in the form of strong majority governments capable of taking the hard decisions that are necessary to deal with uh, economic problems. That's the, the PR line uh, for uh, first past the post. What are the flaws in our current system? They're fairly well known. Um, very important to me, the exclusion of new voices, uh, especially I mean, as we see the Green Party uh, having a, a hell of a time uh, breaking through the barrier to uh, getting substantive representation in the House of Commons because of uh, the current uh, electoral system. And it also poses very high barriers uh, to the election of women, minority, and aboriginal people. We have to embrace the idea that majority governments are a bad thing. They lead to excessive executive power, and without PR, we can't break through uh, that, uh, that particular flaw. Okay, so what has this got to do with inequality? Well, there is a body of research by this uh, political scientist uh, named Eric Lightheart that links so-called consensual democracies, those that rely on PR systems or a form of proportionality, with a whole range of more favorable economic and social outcomes. Higher levels of social spending, uh, less uh, social conflict, uh, improved environmental performance, and lower levels of of economic inequality, somewhat.